Genesis chapter number 4, and uh, tonight in the adult class we'll be looking at another instance of God asking questions. We spent a couple weeks in Genesis chapter number 3, and this, this is anything but a doctrinal series. Uh, this is not a doctrinal series, and, and that's, uh, I think, good for us to get a little bit of a change up, because on Sunday mornings we've been in going through Revelation chapter 2 and 3, that would be... Uh, known as more expositional or doctrinal kind of a series. There's practicality to it, but it's more of a doctrinal series. And then on Wednesday nights, we're going through Malachi, uh, given the interpretation of of, of that book. And so a lot of heavy emphasis on on doctrine. Uh, This series is is different. We're taking a a step away from that. And this is more of a topical series where the goal is to make spiritual applications to our lives from these passages of Scripture. Um, and so that's what we're looking at, okay? We're, it's, this is not a style of preaching that I do a lot of, and I think that's why the Lord is having me to do it, to help me to, uh, to, to get used to this and, and to, to, try to try to get good at applying some of these truths. And so my prayer is that God will give us ears to hear, amen? What the Spirit would say to the church, spiritual ears and, and a sanctified mind and the ability to receive some practical uh, advice for daily Christian living. We've looked at the question that God asked Adam, where he said, Adam, where art thou? Uh, And then we've looked at the question that God asked Eve, where he says, what is this that thou hast done? And tonight, we're going to be looking at the question that God asks to their firstborn son, uh, Cain. And We'll read the the whole story to get the context. So let's begin in verse number 1, Genesis chapter number 4 and verse number 1. The Bible says, And Adam knew Eve his wife, and she conceived and bare Cain. And said, I have gotten a man from the Lord. And she bare again his brother Abel. And Abel was a keeper of sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. And in process of time it came to pass that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord. And Abel he also brought of the firstlings of his flock and of the fat thereof. And the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering. But unto Cain and to his offering... He had not respect. And Cain was very wroth, and his countenance fell. And the Lord said unto Cain, Why art thou wroth? And why is thy countenance fallen? If thou doest well, shalt thou not be accepted. And if thou doest not well, sin lieth at the door. And unto thee shall be his desire, and thou shalt rule over him. And Cain talked with Abel his brother, and it came to pass when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel his brother and slew him. And the Lord said unto Cain, Where is Abel thy brother? And he said, I know not. Am I my brother's keeper? And he said, What hast thou done? The voice of thy brother's blood crieth unto me from the ground. And now art thou cursed from the earth, which hath opened her mouth to receive thy brother's blood from thy hand. When thou tillest the ground, it shall not henceforth yield unto thee her strength, a fugitive and a vagabond shalt thou be in the earth. And we'll, we'll stop reading there. We've made this statement the last two weeks, and you'll hear it probably every message. But remember, when God asks these questions, they are not because God needs the answer. He's asking these questions because we need the answer. The person that He's speaking to needs the answer. And technically there are five questions that God asks of Cain in this passage of Scripture. And we'll look at each of them to differing degrees. But I want to title the message tonight after that first question that God asks in verse number 6 where He says, Why art thou wroth? Why art thou wroth? That word wroth, it means very angry. Uh, The the Hebrew word that's used here for wroth, it brings with it the idea of a burning rage. Has anybody ever seen the, the old cartoons? I remember where uh, somebody would start to get angry and they would basically turn into a thermometer, right? And you see the, the red and it starts down low and it starts to boil up and it goes all the way up to their head until their head explodes, right? That's kind of what he's talking about. When he talks about this ro- being wroth, it's talking about a heated anger. It's something that is consuming him and it is something that is exploding on his countenance. And that's what he says when he says, And why is thy countenance fallen? So basically the, that his countenance, is his, his facial expressions are reflecting the fact that he is angry to this degree. And so by answering this question, or in order to answer this question, I want to begin by looking at the context 
uh, of, of this story. We just read a lot of it, but we understand that from Genesis chapter number 3, uh, things changed a whole lot. Uh, there's a huge difference between Genesis 1 and Genesis 4, and, and the difference would be the fall of Genesis chapter 3. Now they are living and abiding in a world that is full of death, that, that has disease and decay because of the fall of man. And so now there is this new creation, you could say, that they've entered into a new world that is, that is filled with sin. And in this passage of Scripture, we see, we could say, first of all, we see the origin of Cain. Verse number 1, it says, And Adam knew Eve his wife, and she conceived and bare Cain, and said, I have gotten a man from the Lord. The name Cain itself means possession. Uh, and so assuming that he is the firstborn, um, and I think it's safe to assume that, that he's the firstborn child of Adam and Eve, he faced quite a unique situation that nobody else has ever faced before up until this point. Adam and Eve were created perfect. They, they came into this world without a sin nature, right? Cain is the first person who ever had to enter this world with a sin nature. He, he, had to, he had to enter into a world cursed by sin that he himself personally was not guilty of. It was his father that fell, right? It was his mom and daddy that had messed up. But because of, who his, who, of his origin, because of where he comes from, two sinners, Adam and Eve, uh, he comes into this world with a sin nature. That's the origin of Cain. Verse 2, we see the occupation of Cain. It says in verse 2, And she bare again his brother Abel, and Abel was a keeper of sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. Cain being the oldest son, uh, I think he, because of that, he takes up after the family business. Y'all know Adam was a farmer, right? Adam's a farmer. If you go back to chapter number 2, the Bible talks about God creating Adam and He put him in the garden. Chapter 2 verse 15 says, The Lord God took man and put him into the garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. That's farming language, right? In chapter number 3, whenever Adam falls and that curse is given to Adam, God says in Genesis chapter number 3 verse 17, it says, Cursed is the ground for thy sake, and sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. Thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth to thee, and thou shalt eat of the herb of the field. And in thy sweat of thy face thou shalt eat bread, till thou return to the ground. For out of it is what thou taken, for dust thou art, and unto dust thou shalt return. And so Adam, before the fall, is a farmer. After the fall, he's a farmer. And I'm not sure if you, how many of you remember, last week, last Sunday night, Brother Josh Montgomery was preaching, and he, and he mentioned Paul Harvey. Uh, and, and, and Paul Harvey was an old, old uh, radio guy from years ago, and he had that line, you know, here's the rest of the story, and we'll sing a song, I think, next Sunday morning about that. Here's the rest of the story. It's a quotation, really, from Paul Harvey. But Paul Harvey had this monologue, and I haven't heard it in a very long time, but I remember the, the, the title of the monologue was, So God Made a Farmer. So God Made a Farmer. It says, On the eighth day, God made a farmer. And all the things that farmers do. And he talks about the life of a farmer. But listen, that, that is an honorable occupation. Man's got to eat. Ain't nothing wrong with being a farmer, right? The world tells you you got to go to college and you got to get millions of dollars in debt and you have to do this and you have to do that. And if you can't code or if you can't do whatever, work on these computers and stuff, uh, listen, no, that there's nothing wrong with just being a hardworking man, being a farmer. People got to eat. And, and so this is an honorable occupation. And because of his occupation, there are some things about Cain's character that I think could, could rightly be assumed. We could say that he was a hardworking man, right? We could say that he, he was patient. Uh, we, we could say that he uh, was diligent, right? That he was determined, that he was industrious. There's a lot of wonderful things and character traits that are associated with someone who's willing to be a farmer. So we see the occupation of Cain. In the same verse, verse 2, we see the opposite of Cain. It says in verse 2, And she bare again his brother Abel. And Abel was a keeper of sheep, but... Cain was a tiller of the ground. That word but, it's, it's, it's contrasting these two things, right? It means except or besides. And so you have, Cain, or you have Cain on one side, and then you have Abel on the other side. And these two are always put in contrast one with the other, right? You don't hear anybody talking about Cain unless they bring up Abel. They're, 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 in, they're uh, mentioned together, they're linked together for all of eternity, but they're constantly compared one to another and they're contrasted with each other. And, and, and it's amazing to think how different they could be when you think about all of the similarities that they shared. I personally, I'm not dogmatic about this. I like to think this. I was talking with Brother Nick about this on Wednesday night. I personally like to think that, that Cain and Abel were twins. 
I personally like to think that. The reason why, my explanation would be in verse number 1, it says, uh, And Adam knew Eve his wife, and she conceived... And bare Cain and said, I've gotten a man from the Lord. Verse number 2 says, and she bare again uh, her, his brother Abel. So you see one conception and two births, right? I'm not dogmatic on that, but I just, you know, when you're preaching, you can say whatever you want to say. But I, I, I like to think that, that they Cain and Abel were twins. And it makes sense to me that they would be so different because I have twins. Uh, i got James and Luke, right? And to think about the fact that James and Luke have the same mom and daddy, they, they're raised in the same house, Right? We try not to treat them any different. We try to be you know, fair and treat them both the same. And, and, and they're in the same environment. They go to the same church, uh, the, the, the same homeschool curriculum, all, all of the things. They eat the same things for the most part. Uh, you know, they're, or we try to, we cook them the same things. My mom made me a look, made a look there. But, uh, but, 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 then, but that's an example of what I'm talking about. They can have everything so similar and yet be so different. It's amazing. That, that they could have so many differences, different likes and dislikes and personalities and interests and fears. James is right-handed, Luke is left-handed. I don't know how that happens. Uh, and so it, it's amazing to think how different that they are. And so keep that in mind when we work through this passage of Scripture that Abel is always presented as the anti-Cain, if you will. He's, he's the opposite uh, that's, that's juxtaposed or compared to Cain. Let's begin looking down in verse number 3. In verse number 3 we see the offering of Cain. Verse 3, well really verse 3 through 5. It says, and it came to pass in process of time, or excuse me, and in process of time it came to pass that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord. And Abel he also brought of the firstlings of his flock and of the fat thereof. And the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering, but unto Cain and to his offering he had not respect. And Cain was very wroth and his countenance fell. It says in this verse that in process of time it came to pass that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering to the Lord. The assumption from that is that this is the first time that Cain ever brought an offering of the fruit of the ground. I believe that the text would indicate that. that this is the first time that he's ever done that. I do not believe that this is the first offering that Cain has ever brought. The fact that it says, and in process of time it came to pass, it's insinuating that things were going one way, but over a period of time there was something that switched... There's something that changed, and, and apparently now after the process of time of Cain bringing acceptable offerings and doing the right thing, now something has changed in Cain's mind and Cain's life, and now he's decided to bring a different kind of offering than he used to bring. So I think Cain was instructed as to how to bring an offering that's acceptable to God. You say, well, how do you know that? Abel knew what to do. Where do you think he heard it from? There... If this were multiple choice, there's not a whole lot of people to choose from, right? We've got a limited number of people here, and I think it's fair to say Adam uh, and Eve, they, 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 they taught their children, this is how you approach God. I'm sure he probably tells them about Genesis chapter number 3 where they had made those aprons of fig leaves, but then God performs a sacrifice and He makes coats of skins for them and He covers their nakedness. And so we see that as a picture of the righteousness of Jesus Christ, right? And how that we're saved by grace through faith. And when Jesus Christ, uh, because of His shed blood, you can apply His righteousness to you and it can be a covering for your guilt and for your shame. That's what's pictured in the offering that Abel brings. And I believe that they were both told how to do this, but eventually Cain changes his mind about what God will accept. And he decides to bring something that is the work of his hands. Remember, he's a farmer. And, 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 and so because he's a farmer, he, that, that's what he can do. That's what he can produce. And he decides, I'm going to take what I know how to do. I'm going to take that which was within my power, within my means, and I'm going to offer that to God. His offering is rejected, while Cain's, or excuse me, yeah, Cain's is rejected while Abel's is accepted. And that's what leads him into this boiling rage. That's the context. Let's look now, secondly, at the conversation. The conversation. Verse number 6. God begins by asking three pointed questions. Verse number 6. And the Lord said unto Cain, Why art thou wroth? Or why are you angry? Remember, God knows the answer. The answer is to benefit Cain. God shows up to Cain, and you know why he's angry? I believe it's because he's resentful. That God 
accepted Abel's offering and not his offering. I believe he's jealous. He's jealous of Abel's acceptance and of his rejection. He's, he's, up, he's upset and he's angry because his best was looked down upon. And as far as he can tell, Abel's occupation is being blessed and accepted. Right? Abel's a keeper of sheep. And he was supposed to bring of the, the, the firstlings of the flock. And so Abel's occupation is being blessed and Cain's occupation is being, uh, is being uh, looked down upon and being rejected. Men find their identity oftentimes in their occupations. Right? If you ask a man who, who he is, he will just as quickly tell you, I am a welder. Right? I am an electrician. Not, that's what I do for a living. They start off knowing that that is who I am. And when a man puts his hand to something, it becomes a part of his life, it becomes a part of his identity, and he, and he somehow he finds validation in that. And to see his identity and to see what he has attached himself to, rejected in favor of his little brother's uh, occupation, it seems like that's being blessed. Uh, you can see how he'd get mad about that, right? I've got an older brother. Uh, I know what it is. If you want up your older brother, he's not happy about it. He's going to be upset about that. And so we see the anger that's rising up in, in Cain. The second question, he says, And why is thy countenance fallen? Again, that word countenance, it's, a, it's, it's the human face. It, it is your uh, expression on your face. God is basically saying, why the long face? That's how we would say it today. Why the long face? You know, why, why is your disposition so poor? And then the third question he asks, and this is something that I think is completely overlooked in this passage of Scripture. The third question he asks is, If thou doest well, shalt thou not be accepted? People have this idea that before the foundation of the world, you know, God picked that Abel would be accepted and that Cain would be rejected and there's nothing that Cain could possibly have done to have been accepted by God. The only problem with that is the Bible. Amen? It's the only problem with that. The Bible messes up a lot of theology, doesn't it? A, a lot of our ideas about things. Well, it, it's not that, that, that Cain was just destined to be damned and to be rejected. No, God looks at him and says, you have a choice. It wasn't like he messed up one time and God squished him under his thumb and, and that was the end of the story. God looks at Cain who has fallen and who is angry and he shouldn't be and he looks at Cain and says, if you do well... You'll be accepted. There was, a, there was a world in God's mind in which Cain could have been accepted by God. Is that not what the text says? He says, if, that, that insinuates there's a possibility, that there's a chance, that you, you, you could do otherwise. If thou doest well, shalt thou not be accepted. Essentially he's saying that if you want, and then he goes on to say at the end of verse number 8, he says, and unto thee shall be his desire and thou shalt rule over him. What he's saying is, if you want to be the eldest, if you want the birthright, if you want the blessing of being the eldest, do well. Do well, and you will be accepted. And then God gives a warning. He says, if thou doest not well, he says, if thou doest well, shall thou not be accepted. If thou doest not well, sin lieth at the door. There's a lot of uh, debate about what that means when it says sin lieth at the door. Uh, I, I read commentators, you know, and, and they're just commentators. I always love that joke. Y'all probably don't like it, but I think it's a funny joke. They're just common, commentators, and, and if you read them for a little while, you'll understand. Yeah, they're, they're not maybe as bright as they, as they seem to be. Uh, and, and a lot of them are Bible correctors, and they'll say, well, by sin, it's not talking about sin, it's talking about a sin offering, and, and that, that, it's, that it lieth at the door, it's, it's crouching at the door, and they give all these big explanations for, for what God's saying. I, I, think, I think that the simplest answer is probably normally the right answer. When it says, if thou doest not well, uh, that, that sin lieth at the door, I believe what he's saying is that if you willingly rebel in your heart against me that sin is near. It lieth at the door. He's basically a way of saying that, that it's near and it is ready to control you. It is ready to devour you. It is ready to destroy you. 
And we read the rest of the story and we understand that sin was lying by the door and he made the wrong decision and he didn't do well and he had to suffer the consequences of those actions. Rather than doing well and being accepted by God, and let me say this, in order for Cain to do well, he would have had to submit, in a sense, he would have had to turn to his brother for help. Cain, Abel was a keeper of sheep. And if that was the offering that was acceptable to God, Cain was going to have to humble himself and go to his brother and talk to him to receive an offering from his brother, maybe trade some fruit for it or some vegetables for it or something, and, and, and make out a deal to where he could turn to his brother. And, and that's going to take humbling himself, right? To say that my works aren't good enough. I need somebody else's works to, to, to allow me to be accepted by God. And, and he was unwilling to do that, and he is exiled because of it. Lastly, we've seen the context in the conversation. I want to say something about the charge of these verses. Or what is the practical applications that we can make to our lives today from, from this story? First of all, I would say allow resentment to produce repentance. Allow resentment to reduce repentance, to produce repentance. When God asks the question, why art thou wroth? It was to expose the resentment to Cain in his own heart. It was so that he could understand and, and come, to, come to grips with the fact that I'm, uh, I'm angry at God, I'm angry at Abel, and I really don't have any right to be. And in his mind, he's angry because God has treated him unfairly. God, you've been better to somebody else than you've been to me. And that resentment becomes bitterness in his heart and he's bitter toward God and he's bitter toward his brother and the only person that did something wrong was him. The problem was him. And yet rather than they come to grips with that and come to terms with that, he wants to point his finger at everybody else and blame everybody else for his misfortune and for his decision to sin against God. I think we got a lot of Christians today, if they'd be honest, they're living in a state of bitterness. They're thinking back how, to other people, how the other people have wronged them. Oh, I got hurt in church. They're thinking how that, well, God, you, you, you've been better to, to so-and-so than you've been to me. You know, look at their house and look at their cars and look at their kids and look, look at how everything has worked out in their life. And they look at themselves and they look at their life. And, and they begin to, to compare themselves to other people. And they get bitter and they get angry at God. Because life didn't turn out the way that they, saw, they thought that it should. Does that make sense? I, mean, I think there are a lot of people who, who, if they'd be honest, that's exactly where they're at tonight. That's why they're wroth. That's why they're angry. Because they're not happy with where they are. And rather than, listen, it's hard to admit that you're where you are because of what you've decided to do. That's hard. But when God shows up and He asks, Why art thou wroth? That is an opportunity to repent. And you're going to do one or the other. You're going to continue further in your bitterness. You're going to, you're going to retreat further into that bitterness and become even harder to, to reach after that. Or you can, you can allow that to be a wake-up call. Amen? And you can say, well, God, you know what? I'm wrong, and it's not everybody else's fault. This is what I've done. This is where I've put myself because of my decisions, and I have no right to be bitter against you or anybody else. Amen. Ephesians chapter number 4, and verse number 31 says, Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. He said to put it away. What's the old saying? That bitterness is drinking poison and thinking that it's going to hurt the person you're mad at and not you. The Bible says to beware lest that root of bitterness springing up, spring up whereby many be defiled. You've got to be careful with bitterness. Amen? And just because, listen, that's not to say that you've never been done wrong. That's not to say that you've never been treated unfairly. What the Bible says is to be kind, tender-hearted one to another, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. Amen. You know why God forgave you? For Christ's sake. Amen. You know why you need to forgive them? For Christ's sake. Amen. Amen. Not because they deserve it, not even because they've asked for it. But, but, but you're going to be held back, you're going to be wroth your entire life 
if you're not willing to get over some things. Amen? I feel like there's, there's some, especially in our culture, in our society, there is, there is currency in being a victim. The more victimized you are, the more, the more oppressed that you are, that somehow means the more virtuous you are and the better person you are. And, and, and that, mean, that, that, that has created a culture in which people are looking to be offended. And sadly, that's come in the church. Where people are, are walking around and they're looking to be wroth. They're looking for something to justify the, their, their anger. And, they'll, and they'll, they'll find it in the smallest and most insignificant things. Well, the preacher didn't shake my hand. And that just confirms everything I already thought about him, right? And, and it's just, you, you, you find the, the confirmation for how you already feel in, in the most insignificant and trivial ways. That's what a bitter person does, right? They're constantly seeking to, uh, to, to find themselves a victim in any situation, and they'll invent, invent things out of whole cloth just to justify their own bitterness. I hope I'm helping somebody tonight. Amen? I, I think there are a lot of people who, if we be honest, that, that's exactly where they're at. They're wroth, and when God shows up and says, Why art thou wroth? They're pointing the finger at everybody else, and they're pointing the finger at God and saying it's because you didn't give me a fair shake, because somebody else had a better hand, somebody else had it better than, that, that they've been blessed more than I've been blessed. And the whole time, the problem is with them, right? Not with everybody else. So allow resentment to produce repentance. Secondly, we wear conviction on our countenance. When God asks and says, why is thy countenance fallen? we find that what's on the inside of Cain has manifested itself on the outside of Cain. That might have been news to Cain. When God comes to Cain and says, why, art thou, why is your countenance fallen? I wonder if Cain is sitting there thinking, oh, did, did he notice? Could he, tell? Could he tell on my face that something was wrong with me? Was I expressing that? What we don't understand is that you wear conviction on your countenance. What you're thinking, what's on the inside of your heart and mind, we wear it on our faces. Now some people can hide it better than other people. Some folks are easier to read. I, I completely get that. But listen, the longer that I preach to y'all, you folks, the longer I preach, the easier it is for me to tell when I'm, when I'm plowing down your road. Amen? It, it's, it's, it's pretty simple. It's pretty easy. There are some preachers, and this is why, there are some preachers who preach to the ceiling uh, they're fussing at the lights about something. They're just shaking their, their fist at the sky. Or they'll preach to the floor, and they're examining the ceiling tiles the whole time, and they're preaching to the floor. I don't do that, okay? I don't like to do that. The reason I don't like to do that is because... Now, it would be a lot more comfortable for me sometimes to not have to see some expressions and some countenances. That'd be easier for me. But if I, when I'm sitting in the chair, I don't like for somebody to preach to the floors. It just bothers me. I have a hard time listening. I have a hard time paying attention. I'm saying, well, we could just go ahead and leave because he's not talking to us anyway, right? And so I try not to do that. I try, try to make eye contact and move around the room and look over here and look over there. And I'm not doing that necessarily to get a read on anybody. But listen, you wear your countenance on your face and, and you wear conviction on your face. And if something is wrong with you, uh, listen, the whole church knows about it. You may think you're hiding it. You may think nobody can tell that I'm in a terrible mood today and, and that I'm bitter or that I'm angry about something. But, but, but everybody can see it. It was on Cain's countenance. It was something that he wore, that everybody saw that, that he was miserable and that something was wrong in his life. Listen, if you go through your entire life looking miserable, something is wrong. Something's wrong. Galatians chapter 5 says that, says that the fruit of the Spirit is love. What's the second one? Joy. Joy. If you're saved, you should have some joy in your life. If you're right with God, you'll have a smile on your face. Amen? I'm not saying everything's perfect. I'm not saying life is exactly what you want it to be. But, but because we're saved, we have the spiritual gift of joy. That means that we can be happy no matter what our happenings, no matter what our circumstances of life. There's an inward joy that puts a smile on our face. Amen. And listen, we, we weep. The Bible says to weep with them that weep. I understand all of that. But, but someone whose lifestyle is characterized by bitterness and they wear it on their countenance and they're angry every day, Listen, you're walking around and you're bringing a cloud around with you. Y'all ever met anybody like that? 
I have. I absolutely have. Everywhere they go, there's just this dark cloud that's just following them around everywhere they go. So I don't want to be that kind of person. Right? I, I, I want people, when they come in contact with me, to feel better when they leave than, than before. I want to leave people better than I found them. Amen? But yet, if we continue in bitterness and we allow to, that to, to affect our countenance, we're going to have a negative effect on those around us. Does that make sense? So, convictions on your countenance. Thirdly, doing well, we could say this, make this application from this passage, doing well is up to you. Doing well is up to you. Meaning, when he says, if thou doest well, shalt thou not be accepted? He's saying, and I already preached on this, so I'm not going to talk too much about it. I got ahead of myself earlier. But, but, but there is a choice to make. You can choose to serve God. You can choose to live for God. Or you can choose to live for the devil. You can choose to live for yourself. You can choose to live for this world. Whatever. But you can choose. You can choose. And when God tells him, he says, If thou doest well, shalt thou not be accepted. So being accepted is the result of doing well. And he says, If you don't do well, sin lies at the door. So sin lying at the door is the result of not doing well. He tells him what the consequences are going to be ahead of time. You, you get to choose what you do, but you don't get to choose the consequences. Amen. God chooses the consequences. And God has laid out the options. He has laid out the consequences. He says, it's up to you. It's your pick. I tell my boys that all the day. I'll, tell, I'll, I'll whoop one of them, and I'll sit down with them and tell them, now listen, listen, James, you know that you could never get a whooping again? His eyes light up. Really? So yeah, buddy, it's, it's completely up to you. Every time you have gotten a whooping, it's because you chose to get a whooping. It wasn't, it wasn't, I, I laid down what was going to happen, I told you what the consequence was going to be, and I said, you have a choice to make. What you could do is just choose right. That's a revolutionary idea, isn't it? You could choose right. You could choose to live for God. You could choose to make decisions that are pleasing to Him. You could choose to offer sacrifices that are acceptable to Him. You have a choice. The consequences are clear. And listen, we, we've seen so many people make the wrong choice. That's why it's important that we stress this to our young people. I've seen so many people make the wrong choices. I know what the results are. Listen, I know what the results are of drinking alcohol. I've seen the results. I know what the results are of drug addiction. I know what the results are of fornication. I, I, I've seen the results. I, I know the lifestyle. I know, I know the heartbreak. I know the consequences of those sins. And so if you choose to indulge in those things, you are, you are therefore you're choosing those consequences. But there, but there is a choice to make. Amen? A couple more things. One would be, and we've been preaching on this some on Wednesday nights, but we do see it again in this passage of Scripture. This is what me and Brother Nick were talking about the other day. But the offering reflects the offerer. On our last two messages in Malachi on Wednesday nights, we've brought this up. And that is that when, a, when someone brings a sacrifice to God, it's a reflection of who God is to that man. All right? Cain's worthless offering was a reflection of Cain's wicked heart. The Bible tells us that. 1 John chapter number 3, it says, Not as Cain, who was of that wicked one, and slew his brother, and wherefore slew he him, because his own works were evil, and his brother's righteous. The Bible says, 1 John 3, that Cain was wicked. And Cain's wickedness was, was manifested in the offering that he brought to God. The life that you and I, I made this statement before, but the life that you and I live for God is the life that we think God deserves. Amen. It's an accurate reflection of who we are. Right? Amen. And so if my prayer life is hit or miss, that's an accurate reflection of who I am. Right? Yeah. If, 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 my, if my Bible reading is non-existent, that's an accurate reflection of who I am. Amen. It goes for all of us. Anything that we're supposed to... Listen, our lives are supposed to be a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable to God. And if the lives that we live for God are, are, are wicked, if, if, I mean, if the life we live is a wicked life, that's an accurate reflection of who we are. 
Amen? And who our God is to us. Is this the end? Yeah, one more. We see from this passage of Scripture, look down in, in verse, verse number 8. Verse number 8, we see that envy leads to murder. Verse number 8 says, And Cain talked with Abel's brother, and it came to pass when they were in the field, that Cain rose up against Abel his brother and slew him. Envy lead, we see that. Envy leading to murder. I was in a camp meeting, this is probably 10 years ago or so, I was up there at the Greer Baptist camp meeting, and I showed up there to hear Brother Brian McBride, one of my favorite preachers on the planet, Brother Brian McBride. And he gets up there preaching. This is a camp meeting, all right? And I want to say it might have been, it might have been a morning service. So it's, it's mostly just preachers in there. That's what it is, just a bunch of preachers in there for the most part. And he gets up, and he takes his text, and he starts preaching uh, about Joseph and about how that his brothers, you know, he had that coat of many colors, and they, the Bible says that they envied him. And they, they take Joseph and they, they put him in the pit and they sell him into slavery. And then they take that coat of many colors, right? And they dip it in blood and they take it back to Jacob and they say, is, is this your son's coat? And what Jacob says is this. He says, surely an evil beast hath devoured him. And he preached a message out of that text. He said that that is a true statement. An evil beast has devoured Joseph. And he said that that evil beast is envy. He preached on an evil beast among the brethren. Envy. Okay, that was a heavy message. <laughs> I mean, 10 years later, I'm still talking about that. Just what, I mean, a, a tremendous thought. But what he said was essentially that, that envy, and when you study it throughout the Bible, envy is always in association with death and with murder. Job 5 says, For wrath killeth a foolish man, and envy slayeth the silly one. Proverbs 14 says, A sound heart is the life of the flesh, but envy the rottenness of the bones. Proverbs 27, Wrath is cruel and anger is outrageous, but who is able to stand before envy? Think about that. He says, Wrath is cruel, anger is outrageous, but, but who can stand before envy? When you're looking at other people and you're envying them, you're coveting them, you're jealous of them, that, that is one of the most dangerous things sins that you can be guilty of. Amen? I was talking with Brother Jeff. I was talking with Brother Jeff yesterday about just how easy envy can pop up. Remember that? We were talking about there. I told him I was in a meeting and uh, I, I was in one of these camp meetings and they were calling from the floor and, and I'm nervous. I do not want to be called on to preach. I'm sitting there, please, Lord, let them call on somebody else. Somebody else can preach. That's fine. And then they call on somebody else to preach. And you know what runs through your heart and mind for just a second? Well, he could have called on me to preach. I could do better than that guy. <laughs> well, you know, uh, and, then, and then the whole time you're sitting there, you're thinking, well, well, why didn't he call on me to preach? Brian McBride in that message, he said, I was, I was in a meeting, I was standing with a bunch of pastors, and uh, one of the pastors said, hey, uh, I got brother so-and-so coming to preach revival for me. And brother Brian McBride said, I was sitting there, I was thinking, well, he ain't never asked me to come preach. And he, and he said, I couldn't even go if I wanted to. I'm already booked that week. But, 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 but I wanted him to ask me. Listen, you, you do the same thing. Yeah. Amen. I mean, that is the natural pride of man to be envious, to feel, like, to feel like the whole world should belong to you. And this whole thing should just revolve around you. And you, you should be the center of everyone's attention all the time. But that's not life. Amen. That's not how it goes. That's not how it is. And if we live our life expecting everyone to bow at our feet and to throw palm branches out in the way every time we cross the street, then we're, we're going to live an envy-filled life, and that is a miserable life. Amen? And it's a life that eventually would lead to murder if, we, if it could. Amen? Miss Alicia, if you'll move towards the piano, let me ask you tonight, why art thou wroth? Is there any bitterness in your heart? Is there any anger in your heart, towards anybody else, towards the Lord. If we're, going to, if we're going to have God accept our offerings, we're going to have to humble ourselves before Him. We're going to have to acknowledge this whole thing don't revolve around us. We're going to have to do well because we can. Amen.